So I'm excited to give this message. Um, the reason I'm fired up to give this message is this is actually something that I was terrible at as a new DM. I was absolutely, um, it, was, it was a weak spot for me the first couple years. In a brief history, in 2013 as a new DM, uh, at the end of my first summer, I had one to two fringe assistant managers, and uh, at the end of the summer, both quit. I had zero candidates in Olean. I had zero offices promoted. I ended up closing my office a few weeks later because I didn't want to rebuild. So that's a picture of my staff <laughs> that year, which I didn't even make it to 2014, which is, uh, which is pretty funny. Uh, left the business, came back uh, as a DM in 2015 uh, after spending a year with Dan Faraday. For those who know Dan Faraday, he was one of the best developers in our division and in the region for a while. And I watched him develop an army of assistant managers. I ended the summer uh, in 2015 with 12 management candidates. I finally fit, felt like, man, I figured this out. I've got this army. We're ready to go. We had 12 management candidates. We had seven candidates on the Olean trip. Then we got back from the Olean trip, and five of them quit in the next three weeks after Olean. Of the two remaining, <laughs> one got a girl pregnant, and the other was that pregnant girl. So both of those guys quit after a year in banquet, zero offices, promoted again, and I had to start building my assistant manager staff from scratch again. So once again, that's a picture of my district team in 2016. The next year, we had seven candidates at the end of the summer, two quit in September, one quit in March, and my top candidate who I thought, man, this is going to be my first district manager, he was arrested for meth. I always just thought he was really excited. I don't know. So, <laughs> so that didn't work out. <laughs> but we finally promoted our first district team. I don't know what was going on. You know, the saw dude was like a thing back then. So we took a picture. Um, and I love this picture because two of these guys are actually here in this room right now. They were going out as branches that summer, but we finally had our first class. We launched two branches, one district manager for summer 2017. That same summer in 2017, I moved to a new territory. I moved from East Tucson to East Valley, which is in the Phoenix area. Uh, this time it was a little different. You know, uh, Allison had, was, uh, <coughs> Allison was, uh, you know, has a, a disability. So she has special needs. I'm a single dad. You know, every little sister was still very, very young, moving up to a new territory, you know, on my own, building an office from scratch. It was, it was something that was a very scary moment for me. It was a move that I wanted to make. But my one single focus that year was to get really good at targeting and developing assistant managers. I, I wanted, not wanted, I needed an organization that could function without me having to be there 12 hours a day. So I set aside all CPO goals, and I just told myself that I was going to make assistant manager development my program. And I ended the first summer with 15 at the first leadership academy. We had 10 people in Olean, and we had eight offices launch that next summer. And that is this crew right here. 2018, this group led to this. And that was special. And this year, we're going to do it again. So that's a picture of the end of SC2. About most of those people were, you know, all people I had napkin talks with, invited into TLA, and are part of our leadership academy. So let's talk about what created this. Because this was the program that allowed me to scale our sales and scale our district team to Silver Cup levels. You know, first, it was getting past some of the limiting beliefs that hold us back. I remember telling myself all of these things, and I'm sure you guys have told yourself these things before, but my people aren't ready to be promoted. I can't promote them to assistant manager. They're not experienced enough yet. Has anyone told themselves that before? Right? I told myself that all the time. I felt like they had to be this magical, you know, confident manager, you know, in order to become an assistant manager. It's like, that's not going to happen right away. So, speaking to this, are your standards too high? 
Are you limiting your organization by waiting too long to try to promote people or get people tied in? You know, I'm a firm believer that a lot of people, most people quit in this company because they don't have long-term vision. They don't see anything past making phone calls and doing demos. All they see is, you know, calls and demos. They don't see anything bigger than that. I don't have enough people to promote, right? Lloyd Reagan has been preaching for years, seven assistant managers, and there were times where I didn't even have seven reps on the team, right? And I would tell myself, oh, I don't have enough people to promote. There's no way. Well, promote, if you only have five reps, they should all be assistant managers. That's my philosophy, right? Get them involved. Those are the people, they're, the most important reps are the people that are in front of you and buy into the, to them, right? Give them belief. Give them responsibility. Make them feel part of a team. Build with those people, right? Who, if you don't have seven reps on your team, who can you re-recruit into the business? Who can you bring back into the business? Who are the people that, you know, maybe got off to a, a hot start in the summer, but then they went on that trip, and then they came back from their vacation, and they're like, oh, I just don't know if this is for me, right? Happens every time, man. But can you bring those people back? It's another one I said, I don't, know what I, I don't know what to have them do. There's not enough for them to do. There's always stuff for them to do. You can always have them do, do stuff in the office. And we'll talk about that in a second, right? Are you worried about it financially? I'm not profiting enough. I'm not making enough to pay out more AM pay. Well, here's what I'll tell you about AM pay. AMs are always worth it. Always. If AMs do what they're supposed to do, they are always worth it. So let's talk about 7 AMs. And this is different philosophies in each region, but in our region, 7 AMs is the number. I know some people, you hear five, you hear whatever number, but seven. Let's talk about seven. Seven assistant managers gives you a solid, sustainable base of core reps, right? Summer and non-summer, it's a solid, sustainable base of core reps. You have seven assistant manager AMs on your team, two orders a week, right? $500 a week, that's $3,500 base to build on every single week. In East Valley this summer, out of our 410 new biz, 125 of it came just from our assistant manager team. My staff is proud of the fact that they're beating offices. They're like, how many offices can we beat this week, just as a staff? Right? They're fired up about that. Right? Seven assistant managers gives you enough support right, for your systems, for phone jams, for p your, your PR program. Right? I talk about the selfie squad. The selfie squad, you know, when we're doing the PR app and training, we've got our selfie squad of assistant managers that comes in and helps take pictures. Right? Makes it fun, makes it upbeat. Right? Uh, scrubbing and managing duplicates, like that takes zero skill or talent, right? You say, oh, I don't have anything for an assistant manager to do. We have an assistant manager on our team. Their only job, his only job is to come in for the PR talk, and after we collect names, their only job is to go through duplicates and scrub names and make sure to get them ready to send. And when it's all done, he walks into the training room and gives me a thumbs up. And that's his only job, <laughs> Right? But in my mind, this is the most, one of the most important jobs because this is what allows you to keep your recruiting game high, right? It takes zero skill or talent to do that. You just got to teach them how to read dates. When was the last time this person was contacted, right? It's easy, right? They can support with phone jams, right? They can support with workshops. They can, you know, help with PDI, right? When you have a big team, Right? You can kind of delegate some PDI. I'm a firm believer that bad PDI is better than no PDI. Bad PDI is better than no PDI. And a lot of times, even though it is bad PDI, the rep's just excited. They're fired up that they're able to influence someone. And a lot of times, that energy that they give that rep, even though they're, they're saying things that probably aren't driving demos, right? that inspiration and that belief, it does make a difference to that rep they're coaching and influencing that you might not be able to give to that person, right? 7 AMs gives you enough support, and it also does it in a way that no one gets burnout. It does it in a way that no one gets burnout. I was talking at the round table yesterday, right? 7 AMs at 10 hours a week, that's 70 hours a week in your office, not including you that people are driving demos and booking PRs for your business. And they're doing it in a way that no one gets burnout. I'll talk about 
you know, the staff breakdown, how many hours we give people, you know, kind of what their roles are in a second, but, you know, that's kind of the rule of thumb, 10 to 15 hours at the most during school. So a couple keys here, five steps to implement. You know, if I, I really went back, I looked at the, the early years and, you know, what were the things, where were my, you know, what were the things that I implemented later on that I wasn't doing when I was a new DM? And the first thing is be on the hunt. You always have to be on the hunt, right? Always be targeting people to dev develop. Always be looking for that next person up. In East Valley, we have seven assistant managers, but I've got like 14 to 20 at all times that are ready to promote. If my whole staff quit while I was here at SLC, I would have a whole staff newly promoted within the next 48 hours getting back because we've got people ready. Because we're always targeting people to develop. We're always having conversations. We're always talking to people about what the next step looks like and they're excited about it. Right? So always be targeting people to develop. I'm targeting people in interviews. I loved what Maz said yesterday about the M, right? And circling it. Like that's people basically saying, hey, I would like to advance. And you can target those people, and you know who those people are, who you need to talk to, who you need to plant that seed with in training or through PDI, right? We're, we're, planning, we're on the hunt in training. I'm identifying who my key leaders are. Every single Sunday, every single Sunday, I sit down, and I write down every single rep on my team, and I write down what I think their projected sales could be for the week, but I also write down who are people that I need to have a conversation with this week about a leadership opportunity, even if I'm fully staffed, I want to have conversations with people every week. That way I've got people ready to be the next man up. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me, I'm overcoming a little cold. Um, ready to be the next man up if I have someone that, you know, quits or moves on or that picture I showed you where, you know, I had my first big class. All of those people went and ran offices, so we needed people ready to step up. Next is plant the seed. So who are you targeting? Once you've targeted them, plant the seed. So I'm planting the seed as early as the interview and the post screen. If I have someone that I think would be an awesome assistant manager, I tell them that. Right? And usually what I'll do is I'll do it after I accept them, after I give them the nameless assignment, after I get them fired up to come to training. I say, hey, real quick, by the way, is advancement, here's a question to write down. It's really simple. Is advancement important to you? Is advancement important to you? And most of the time, people will say yes. And that simple question, it just gets them thinking about it, and then it allows me to say, hey, you know, obviously you haven't started training yet, but I want to let you know I do see some leadership traits in you, and if you do the right things, I'm looking for people that stand out, and I'm looking to fill some leadership positions in the office. So make sure you, you know, put an effort to stand out, show up early to train, and crush that nameless assignment. Right? I think a lot of times just talking about advancement, talking about management, it will help, people will go above and beyond, right? You can leverage that to create action. So in the post screen, in training, right? In the hold back of day one, I'm doing an assistant manager stump speech. I'm talking about how awesome assistant manager the, the AM position is. I, I talk about how it was my favorite role uh, as a new rep. I loved being an assistant manager. I loved being in that inner, inner circle in the office. I loved kind of, you know, being one of the people that was working behind the scenes to help others. I loved being an assistant manager, right? There's conviction and belief because I loved being an AM. I talk about the perks that come with it. I say our assistant managers, they get a dual income. You know, my AMs are top reps on the team, so they're selling at 25 or 30 percent or more, but they're also working in the office. They get paid a percentage of office sales. They get a per paid a percentage of overrides. They're like a stockholder in the office. I like using the word stockholder because it's just one of those buzzwords that sounds cool that people get excited about. They're like a stockholder in the office. They have equity in the office. Right? So I'm, promote, I'm talking about this in day, t day one holdback, and I'm you know, talking about these opportunities, and I'm saying, hey, so what am I looking for? I'm looking for consistency. Right? If I'm going to promote someone, they need to be consistent in three areas. They need to be consistent in their sales. They don't need to be number one every single week. I, I'm not going to promote the rep that has a you know, $5,000 week but then takes the next week off, but the rep that's consistently hitting their goals. Consistent, consistent effort. Right? Consistent effort and consistent attitude. They're the most positive, they love the team, and they're always looking to grow, right? And I'm instilling this and telling them what I'm looking for right away, and they go home from day one of training knowing those three things. 
and they start to act on those three things. In first week in PDI, I'm planting the seed, right? And this is at your discretion. Sometimes, a lot of times, I'll just wait till they kind of hit that first promotion because that's that emotional high, right? They feel super excited. They just hit their first promotion. And I like to use those emotional highs to create action, right, and buy-in. Um, sometimes, if I, don't have, if, I, if I don't have 7 a.m.s, if I'm you and I have two assistant managers, like as soon as my rep makes a, their first sale, and if it's someone that I'm vibing with, they have a good attitude, they're trying, and I vibe with them, right? You know those reps, they call in for PDI and they're just stoked, right? They're fired up. They sold a cutting board and they're like, ah, first sale, right? So, you know, I'm having, this, I'm having this conversation. I learned this in Dan Faraday's office. We called it popping the question, right? Popping the question. I pop question, the question to every one of my reps, right? But it's like, hey, have you thought about management, right? Such a simple question. Have you thought about management? And they say no. It's like, hey, no worries. You just started. I just want to let you know, I really like you so far. I've enjoyed working with you. And if you keep doing the right things, you know, it's definitely a conversation we could have in the future, right? And I'm just planting the seed. I'm getting them to think about it, right? If they say yes to that question, you have the cocky kids like, yeah, I want to be an AM. It's like, okay. And then I pull the carrot back, right? And it's like, all right. Well, hey, man, you just started. Um, so you're not there yet, you know. But hey, if you keep doing the right things, it's definitely a conversation that we could have. So it's the same conversation, but I'm having this conversation with like almost every single rep on our team. We're priming the next level of leaders at all times, right? Next, give them vision. So once you've identified, you know, targeted and planted the seed, you're going to take, I at a minimum, every single week, two people in my office I'm having a napkin talk with. This summer I had 50, I went back in my schedule, I had 56 nap, napkin talks this summer. That's why we have 20 in TLA, because, you know, we just, we talk to everyone about it. Two napkin talks, it's the first thing I schedule in my planner each week is the napkin talk. When I'm going to do them, who they're going to be with. Sometimes it's three or four, but at least two. Right? And if you're like, oh, I, don't, I didn't launch anyone, I don't have any reps, I've, everyone's had a nap, do another napkin talk again with another rep. If their last napkin talk was a month ago and you just talked about assistant manager, we'll have another napkin talk about branch. Right? Get them excited about the short term, but get them thinking about the long term, right? What this could turn into. A napkin talk is really simple. Ask your, you know, your, your division manager for some guidance with that, or you can reach out to me. Um, I have a napkin talk scripted out word for word, but it's got to be genuine, and it's got to come from the heart, and it's got to have conviction in the opportunity. So I'm talking about you know, branch, I'm talking about district, I'm walking them through finances, right? I'm having crazy, like, what if conversations, like, hey, what if you could have school paid off, not just by the time you graduate, but a year before you graduated, like Alan Hernandez did, right? What if you could be on pace to buy your first house within a year after graduating, right? I'm having those types of conversations. I've given them a long-term vision, right? That's what retains reps. People don't quit when they have a long-term vision. Next, get them involved, right? As soon as that napkin talk is over, I'm driving that, hey, let's get to 6K, let's get to 10K, or let's get to whatever level, right? And we can talk about you being an assistant manager, but in the meantime, hey, why don't you come to the staff meeting? Why don't you come to our next staff meeting, meet our staff, you know, get to know our assistant manager team. You're kind of going to feel weird because you'll be sitting in the back and you're not really going to say anything, but it'll be cool for you to see the behind the scenes stuff. Ask them for their leadership on the sales report. Ask them to come to a couple phone jams and take a couple reps under their wing and take them field training. Have them come second man an interview, right? Teach them how to second man an interview. It's an easy way to get someone to be excited about being a manager. They feel like they're influencing, you know, and they're influencing applicants and they, they get a taste of that management bug and they're fired up. Next, keep it basic. Right? Once someone is assistant manager, don't overwhelm them. This was a huge mistake I made right away as I either gave them not enough to do. I didn't, I didn't want to delegate anything because I, I was scared that they would mess it up. I didn't trust my people. Right? But when, what you're really saying when you're not giving someone responsibility, you're not really saying that you don't trust them. You're actually saying that you don't trust yourself well enough to teach them the right way. So maybe you should work on those skills yourself too. Because right? that was true for me. 
The reason I didn't feel comfortable having someone else learn how to do PDI is because I wasn't very good at PDI and I needed to work on it. Right? So don't overwhelm your people. Don't try to teach them everything right away. I remember I was, you know, I had this assistant manager who's really sharp. He had a 10K fast start. I'm like, he's sharp. He can handle it. I'm trying to teach him like PDI and interviews and PCs and, you know, all this stuff. And then he's also starting his first semester of college and then gets overwhelmed and quit. Right? So in the fall and spring, it's like 10 hours max per week. 10 hours max. Right? I am not wanting to overwhelm them. You know, I'm putting myself in their shoes. It's like they're starting their first semester of college or second semester of college and they're still getting used to their classes and that schedule and meeting new friends and they've, you know, got all of that and then they still feel like they have to sell and then you're giving them 30 hours in the office. That's not going to happen. Right? 10 hours maximum. You know, a lot of times I'll have my one right-hand person that is in there three or four days a week. Um and everyone else, it's 10 hours, maybe 15 if they're like really part-time in school, right? And here's my assistant manager's jobs, okay? Here's their jobs. It's very simple. Sell a grant every week, or at least put in the effort to sell a grant. It's okay to have a down week. It's not okay to have a down month, right? You're consistent every week. They run a workshop and a phone jam, which by the way, as a new DM, I was like, why, you know, I, I, I can't have this rep run a workshop. They're not even that good at selling yet. And then I got the brilliant idea, just play a Vector Connect talk. That's their workshop. And their job is to run a workshop. It doesn't matter if five people show up to the workshop. It doesn't matter if one person shows up. It doesn't matter no one shows up. Their, their job is to run a workshop and a phone jam. So if no one shows up, guess what they're doing? They're running a workshop and a phone jam, and that workshop is actually more for my assistant manager because I know that this AM can go sell 3K every week with the right focus, and if they're listening to a Vector Connect talk at the office every single week, and then they're running a phone jam for themselves and booking three to five demos right after that, I know that that assistant manager is going to sell. And if I have every single assistant manager on my team running a workshop and running a phone jam, sometimes two workshops and two phone jams per week, all my assistant managers are going to sell, and therefore all of my assistant managers are going to be worth that office pay. They pay for themselves. So they sell a grand, they run a workshop and a phone jam, they book five PRs, right? And for us, conveyor, it, our efficiency is, I would love to give a talk on that at another time, but uh, our, con our conveyor efficiency is really, w is really good. And we have a Snapchat program that's awesome. We book a ton of PRs through automation, through conveyor, through Snapchat. It's amazing. And our assistant manager team is really just there to pick up the slack and call lost texts and unreached, and they book five PRs, right? And then maybe later on, sorry about that, maybe later on, I'm ha teaching them interviews or how to run an AT2. I'm not doing any of that stuff right away. I just want them to master the fundamentals, understand the foundations of our recruiting, and have more conviction and belief in the rep opportunity. And the way they get conviction and belief in the rep opportunity is by experiencing it for themselves and going and selling a lot. And they're able to influence others because they believe in it. So staffing breakdown, I have two departments. I have a recruiting department and I have a sales department. And you don't have to do this right away. This is something that we have done the last couple of years, but recruiting department and a sales department. This is basically was created with the idea of I don't wanna overwhelm my people. So instead of them teaching PDI and PCs and learning interviews, why don't I just have them focus on one side first, get them good at it, and then the next semester we can switch them to the other department, right? So my recruiting department, I've got my like right hand AM in that department who we call the recruiting director and they have 15 hours a week. I have that person at 1.5%. And this is someone that, you know, has been an AM for a while. They're good at, inter they're running a couple interviews a week. They're in charge of really uh, driving the PR program, running blitz days, um, you know, making sure we hit our PR numbers every single week. We also have our recruiting assistant. And that person is, you know, might run one or two interviews, uh, also in charge of booking a good chunk of PRs. 
We have our Vector Live Assistant, and that person is just coming in uh, three days a week for three hours, uh, usually Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and their job is to go through uh, all of the interview no-shows, training no-shows, call those people, get them rescheduled, going through callbacks, going through, uh, and then once they're done with all of that, they're, they're calling PRs and booking PRs, and they can answer office communications as well because I hate responding to that myself, so I delegate it. Campus recruiting assistant, depending on the time of the year, right, in the summer when we're not focused on campus, that just becomes like the, you know, another recruiting assistant or something. But campus recruiting assistant is just helping you on campus, right? And that schedule can vary depending on when your tables are or what your needs are there. So that's our recruiting department. And then we have our sales department. And we have our sales director who's like the right-hand person. This is the person. So I'm coaching the top 10 reps. So I'm coaching my staff and I'm coaching the top 10 reps. And the sales director is coaching the next top 10, right? The next best 10 reps, right? And we also have uh, the sales director, you know, helping, you know, run team meetings, do a lot of the recognition. They are, you know, essentially the, the sales manager, We've got sales assistant A and B, and they're, they're just running workshops and phone jams twice a week. And that's, that's our staff. That's it. It's simple. We're getting all of the uh, important things that need to happen that really move the needle. What moves the needle in our business? It's recruits and it's demos. And that's what these guys do. I don't get them caught up in the fluff of, you know, teaching them how to, you know, save a rep that tries to quit with a sample. Like, no, create demos, create recruits. And if you have people in your office doing that for 70 hours a week, you're going to have a, a pretty damn good office. So a couple resources for you on the SLC Dropbox. I uploaded a couple documents, and that's our staff roles breakdown. It breaks down the exact roles of each of those people, and uh, also our staff schedule. I put that on there. It's an Excel document, and at the bottom is actually little tabs. You can click the role, and it actually it shows our entire office schedule for the week. But if you click the role, uh, it actually highlights in color that particular person's hours for the week. It's pretty cool. And you can look at those two things. I also uploaded our staff meeting agenda, which is not mine. It's Drew Frank's. It's the big four. Right? So I have 20 seconds left. Last thing. I want to call to action. I want to give you guys a call to action. I want you to make a list real quick. Who are five reps on your team? that you need to have a conversation with and plant the seed about assistant manager right now. And if you don't have five reps, who are reps that you can re-recruit into the business and have that conversation? Thank you.